All right, we are back here in Washington. I am at Mount Baker Mining, my friend Jason's mining shop. But today we are not looking for ore, we are looking for wood. So Jason, where are we headed today? Yeah, we're gonna head down to a piece of property I own. We're gonna do a little logging. We're gonna get some logs, bring them up to my friend that has a sawmill and turn them into boards. Ooh, what are we gonna do with those boards, Haley? We're gonna build a recording studio up at Cerro Gordo. All right, let's hit it. I think that was the, the thumbnail. All right, behind me is the Hunter Cabin here at Cerro Gordo. And this is the space that we are gonna transform into a recording studio. The cabin was originally built in the 1860s by a guy named William Hunter. And Hunter owned a mine just over the peak from here called the Belmont Mine. But he would bring all of his ore back here to Cerro Gordo to refine. So to do that, he needed a lot of mules. So Hunter kept getting more and more mules. And before you knew it, he had 200 mules that all lived right here. And his cabin here was pretty much on his last legs come 10 years ago. But luckily Robert, the old caretaker here, stabilized it and made it into what you see behind me. I think with a little bit of work, it could be one of the most beautiful and inspiring spaces in all of Cerro Gordo, which is a perfect place for a studio. You know, I think that music has always been a part of this town. You know, even in the 1800s, when this was a mining boom town, there's articles about Victor Beaudry, one of the original owners, having a 13 piece brass band that used to walk up Main Street to entertain the miners and the residents. And so as much as music's always been a part of Cerro Gordo's past, I want it to be a part of Cerro Gordo's future too. But bigger things came in the way. You know, the hotel came up, the road keeps getting washed out. And so the studio always got pushed to the back burner. But over the past few years, my good friend Haley's been spending time here. And Haley is the mastermind behind the band Sloppy Jane. You know, she even recorded her entire last album fully within a cave. So she knows what it takes to record in very remote locations. And I feel very grateful that she's now spearheading this project. You know, she knows more than I would ever know what it's gonna to take to take a space like you see behind me and transform it into a recording studio. And now that a lot of the big issues are out of the way, you know, the road is fixed, the hotel is being framed again, there's finally time to focus on the studio. And the first step of that is getting a lot of milled wood. So the first step in this process was to get up to Bellingham, Washington. And Bellingham is a small town right on the Canadian border, kind of by Vancouver. My friend Jason, who owns Mount Baker Mining, has a property up there. I was talking to Jason a while back and he said, listen, you make your way up here. I have a property with some downed trees. We'll go to the property, retrieve the trees, bring them to my friend's sawmill, and you can create some beautiful rough cut lumber for Cerro Gordo. And given that the studio was just underway, it seemed like perfect timing to do this. On the way out to his property, Jason took us by some old growth forests. These forests have just been growing for hundreds if not thousands of years that have these beautiful canopies with all sorts of different types of trees and vines and moss and ferns all over the ground where the light just kind of creeps through them in this beautiful way that makes you feel like you're in a movie. And that whole area, the Pacific Northwest, used to be known for these massive trees and beautiful forests. And in the early 1800s, when the first settlers hit, they were just blown away by the size and scale of these logs. You know, they assume then, you know, we can just log forever and never run out of trees. And in 1848, a big boom happened to the logging industry, and that was the gold rush. Just down the way in San Francisco hit, and they needed lumber for everything, for the mines, for the towns they were building. So the logging industry up in Washington and Bellingham just exploded. So then, in about the 1930s, loggers started to think, hmm, maybe we can't cut down these forests forever. And so whispers started of reforestation. You know, hey, you guys should start putting back trees before you take them away. And then eventually the government got involved in 1948. They put together an act that said you have to replace the timbers that you cut down. And so nowadays, when you go around Washington, if you're not in one of these old growth forests, you're probably in an area that was reforested in the last hundred years. But still, those trees are 
beautiful and just have all of the right conditions to just grow to these magnificent heights. So we're down at some property I own in Skagit County in Western Washington. And I bought this three or four years ago as kind of a recreational property for me and my family to come to. I got some machinery that you might be able to see here behind me. And my goal was to kind of clean it up, replant some trees. But today we're gonna go out and harvest or kind of salvage some Western red cedar and some dug fir and some spruce. Brent and Haley are gonna take a hand at using the chainsaw and Brent's gonna drive the skidder and we're just gonna have a good time getting some logs. I've planted about 15,000 new seedlings on this property. And so it's really important to me to get the trees to grow up and the ones that I have alive, I wanna keep alive. So all the logging I've ever done on the property has been salvage logging, which means the trees have either been blown over and are dead and are dying, or they're standing up and they have died. So all the wood we're gonna harvest today is, is dead and down, and we're gonna turn it into some beautiful boards. And if you're interested in seeing more of this logging and sawmilling stuff, check out my channel, SJ Forest Products. Oh, and we don't have, there's no snakes here, there's no spiders, there's no, like, there's nothing's gonna get you. Once we got to Jason's property, we took a little tour just to get a sense of the land. You know, Jason's fortunate enough to have some of this old growth forest right on his property. This is the kind of tree that I came in and salvaged because yeah. they're dead, standing dead, and I fell them and cut them into boards. There's something very humbling, very comforting, really, about being around these massive trees. You know, it's the same feeling that I get out here in the desert when I stand and I look at Death Valley and it just goes forever, it seems. It's truly awe-inspiring. Here's your tree. All right. <laughs> nice. This one blew over last winter. Okay. Hold on, let me get through these ferns here. But this is a western red cedar and we had a big windstorm and snowstorm and it blew over. And so we're gonna make boards out of it. There it is. There's your new recording studio. Finally, we came upon this downed cedar and I just felt an immediate connection to it. And I remember going up to it and kind of running my hand along it. I just got excited. So the game plan is, we get in here, we take off all the extra limbs, yep. get the yeah, skitter so. back here and get it out of here. Yeah, come stand over here. So our plan is, the first thing we got to do is bucket off the stump. The stump will probably flop back in that hole. And then we'll go up and we'll cut off all the branches, bucket into logs, and then we'll drag it out to the landing with the skitter. Easy. Easy. So tell me a little bit about the wood that we're getting today. Yeah, absolutely. So Western Red Cedar, it's a very red salmon colored wood. It's uh, smells absolutely amazing. One of cedar's key properties is it's resistant to rot, fungus, and bugs. And so it's used all over the Pacific Northwest for building and outside building because it's real wet here, but it resists the rot. And it's it's just an absolutely beautiful wood. Yeah, I was reading that um, because of the softness of cedar and like specifically cedar, not all softwoods, but that it's very, very good for like soundproofing and like sound diffusion and damping. And then you said that there's like, we're getting like dug fur also for the floors. Yeah, we'll get some dug fur for the floors. Dug fur is a little bit harder wood and used historically for flooring. Yeah. So it'll it'll be a better flooring for you. Cedar's just too soft, you'll wear through it with your shoes and stuff. But mm. I, think, I think cedar's gonna be a beautiful wood for the walls and the ceiling and then the dug fur is gonna make a great flooring for you. Can't wait to see this tree on the walls in Cerro Gordo. So once I start cutting, I'm gonna, I'm gonna come up from underneath because the tree's hanging out in space. And so the top of the log is in compression or is in tension and the bottom of the log is in massive compression. So I'm gonna cut the compression and then I'm gonna come down and cut the tension and the whole log is gonna drop down to the ground. And then the stump, it's always, you never know. It's always, they can either go slow, they can hang there, they can flop down quick. So we're not sure what's gonna happen with the stump, but just nobody stand on the other side so they don't get squished. We'll get this log on the ground and then we'll get it bucked up and trimmed up. Sweet. 
as Jason started cutting it, you know, that first whiff of cedar hit me and it just brought back all sorts of memories. You know, I used to live in this house in Austin that was really old and the closets were made out of cedar to keep the moths away. And going through it, it was just a comforting reminder of something fun. So cedar trees are known to have what's called butt rot. So this is the butt of the log and they sometimes will rot out in the middle like this. And the mills really don't like that because they're, they're, you're hauling all this wood to them and they can't get any good usable boards out of it. But typically if you cut up every two to three feet up the log, the butt rot goes out pretty quick. So I just chucked off this first two and a half feet and we're almost out of the butt rot completely. So we'll leave that little bit in the log. We'll see what Fred has to say about it tomorrow. <laughs> but uh, now we can get a lot of really nice boards out of our log without any rot in the ends. Yeah. Originally, I thought the tree was all hung up on the stump. And when I cut it off the stump, bucked it off the stump, it was gonna fall down in the brush. But it's hung up in a tree back there somewhere. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get the skitter, choke the butt of this log and drag it so the top of it falls in the ground so I'm not limbing and bucking way up in the air. So each one of these rings is one year of growth on the tree. And so this is the whole tree's life story right here in these rings. And you can tell, looking at it, it, it was it germinated and started growing. And it looks like it was growing very, very slow in the understory. So it was suppressed, probably growing in the shade. And then if you count these rings, you can figure out the year right here mm. that something happened. The property was logged, the tree in front of it fell over, and then the tree rings get spaced out quite a bit more. And so it was much happier, it was getting more light. And so it started growing a lot faster at that point. There we go. It's beautiful. It smells amazing. How old is it? I mean, God, at least 10. <laughs> After a little bit of counting, we figured out that this tree is 131 years old, which is crazy. It means it was just a small sapling the time that this town had its last boom. You know, it lived and died as this town sat mostly dormant, and now it's being repurposed to come back here, a town being repurposed, coming back to life. It's just really cool, and it's very exciting. that you do what's called limbing the tree. You take off any limbs that aren't long enough to be used for any type of good wood. You create essentially a log. We've got everything limbed up and now we're gonna bucket into 33 foot logs. It'll be 32 usable feet and that's divisible by eight foot sections. So we'll have four eight foot log sections in one log. We're gonna buck them into log logs because they're easier to drag out. So we'll get my log tape, we'll measure out 33 feet and you always leave that extra one foot called trim or snipe because as you break it down into smaller log sections, you need that extra waste to get it into eight foot sections so you don't end up with a bunch of seven foot, 10 logs. As the saw hit and you know, as the teeth of the saw started digging into the wood, it felt amazing. It just felt like a project finally coming to life that has been a plan since five and a half years ago here at Cerro Gordo. You know, we were getting the lumber to bring back to the town to start the music studio and that was really really cool yes perfect i think that was the, the thumbnail yeah, yeah that was good <laughs> you leave this part over here okay and just yeah just the knob oh right there okay there we go right 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 okay bingo you got it going anywhere <laughs> So this is it. This is the future music studio from within those woods to now out here on this. Next step is to mill this down. But this is the cedar you can see. It smells beautiful. It is beautiful. A lot goes into making these boards. So we got to figure out how many board feet are in your log here. And the, the butt log always has the most. This will probably be a third of your wood will be in this one log. But you measure the small end and you measure the diameter. So it's about a 16 inch top on a 16 foot log. Out here on the West Coast, we use the Schribner log scale method. And so there's 170 board feet in that one log. Wow. 
And so the whole tree probably has somewhere three, four, five hundred board feet. Okay. Yeah. So you, you got a lot of good wood in that in that one tree. Yes. Yeah. I'm gonna try and drop it right down my skid road here. And that way I won't kill any of my other seedlings. And then we'll get it drug back out and use it for the mine. And before we left, Jason had a couple dead trees on his property that he needed to fell. You know, so basically these trees that died, they're still standing, but they caused all sorts of issues that they were falling on their own. So we went out there and Jason taught us a little bit about how to pick your line and where you want the tree to fall. You know, how to do the undercut, how to do the back cut. And for me, I've never been in the forest when a giant tree has fallen over. You know, I didn't know if it made noise or not. <laughs> but in this time, there's something very majestic almost to seeing something that large fall right where it needed to. To bring a tree out of the woods to be brought to a mill is called skidding a tree. And so to do it these days, they have an automatic thing called a skidder. And back in the day, the trail you would take into a logging area would be called skid row. And if you were fired from a logging camp, you would be sent on your way down skid row. And skidding has been done in all sorts of ways over the years. There used to be these machines that were drawn by horses or mules that would pull the logs out of the forests. Then, 30, 40 years ago, there are these cool machines, one of which Jason owns, and it is essentially a tractor with a blade in the front and a giant winch on the back. You wrap the cable around the log, the winch pulls it up tight to the skidder, and this thing can articulate and kind of get its way through the forest with just amazing precision and amazing power. So Jason pulled these logs out of the forest, he got them back to the staging area, he loaded them up, and they were good to go. All right, so there it is. There is the future recording studio of Cerro Gordo. The logs are in, we got it out of the woods, and tomorrow we are... We're gonna head up to Fred the Sawmill Guy's place, <laughs> and he's gonna turn these logs into beautiful cedar boards. Sounds great! So I am super excited to finally get this project off the ground. And I wanted to take a couple moments to talk about something that I found very beneficial in managing the stress that comes with all of these projects that I have going on up here at Cerro Gordo. And that's BetterHelp, which is an online therapy platform. BetterHelp is a sponsor of today's video, and I found it just hugely beneficial over the last few years of dealing with the highs and lows that comes with living up here. You know, it's super easy to use because the platform's online, it's remote, all you do is go on to BetterHelp, you answer a quick questionnaire, and they're gonna match you to a licensed therapist. This licensed therapist is trained to help you, you know, to listen to you. I think sometimes up here at Cerro Gordo, things have gotten very dark. You know, I've had a hard time doing baseline tasks, much less, you know, cool projects like building the studio or the hotel. And the therapist has been there, you know, to give me the tools and the knowledge that I need to feel better. And I think, that everybody could use that. You know, everybody could use somebody to talk to to get things off your chest. So anybody watching, BetterHelp is giving 10% off your first month of therapy. All you have to do is go to betterhelp.com slash ghost town living, and that will apply. I have found it hugely beneficial. I think you guys will find it beneficial too. I hope you check it out. So after we spent the day taking these logs out of Jason's property, it was time to bring them to the mill. And our stop that day was Fred and Geraldine's. And Fred and Geraldine just have an amazing setup up there in Bellingham. And Fred and Jason are just two of the best teachers I can imagine when it comes to learning about logging and learning about lumber. What do you think, of, what do you think of Jason's wood? Uh, this one doesn't work very well. Okay. The rest look all right. <laughs> yeah. Well good, this one's hailing. mine and the rest are Brent's. Hey. You don't like my old rotten spruce log I brought you? It's full of debris. What do you mean debris? Garbage. <laughs> Dirt? <Look at> this. <laughs> Look at all that dirt in there. Very bad. What are we going to do about that? Charge for blades. <laughs> Charge extra? Yep. How fast does that thing go? 6,000 feet a minute? Yep. Whoa. 100 feet a second. It's flying. It's flying. We need a lot of wood. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. I really hope that building the studio up at Cerro Gordo will foster a lot of creative community up on the mountain. I think it's a really, really special place that a lot of different kinds of people gravitate towards. I don't know, I can imagine just a lot of 
musicians and artists sitting around a bonfire and going on cool hikes. I'm excited to just hear the different things that come out of the studio and the different kind of groups of like friends and community that it makes. So we're just trying to figure out how much wood Brent actually needs for this project. And it's way more than anybody thought. So we did the math and he needs about 2,500 board feet roughly for this project. And a whole log truck load of wood is like somewhere between four and 5,000. So he's gonna take half a log truck load back to Cerro Gordo with him. Fred's running out of blades, we're running low on time, yeah. but we're gonna make it work somehow. Fingers are crossed. <laughs> there are a few things that I've done recently that are more satisfying to watch than the sawmill just going down and down and down a log and creating this perfect dimension lumber out of a round log. There's something very meditative of watching it. You know, and after the sawmill, some of the boards we've brought over to a rip saw. And Fred has an old rip saw where he could take a board that maybe has some rot over here or some bark you want to take off and get it right down to the dimensions that you wanted. And our main goal that day was cedar. So what we're gonna do is like a big table saw, but it has rollers on the top and a feed conveyor on the bottom. So we'll set up a fence to whatever size you need, four, six, eight, and then it'll run it through. Yep. And we can take off the live edge and it'll be a nice square straight cut. And then you can bump it over to the fence and rip a six or an eight or whatever we're doing. This is the first quarter of the tree, but it's probably about a third of the wood. And we got 35, eight inch by one inch. It's gonna go on some of the walls. And then a couple four inches to boot. I'm gonna go grab some more wood, keep going. You know, when Jason and Fred would get going on the rip saw, these boards were coming out of there as fast as you can imagine. And I was on the other end trying to stack them all in a unique pattern so we could keep track of how many boards were coming off. It was a lot of work, but it's also a lot of fun. We're at the end of day one at the mill. This is our lumber. There, there, there. As you can see, it's all very beautiful, very aromatic, and this will become the studio. And over here we have what was gonna be the waste pile, so all these we're gonna try to make into, you know, I don't know, benches, shelves, fun things. So if you have any ideas, let me know below. As much as it can fit in the truck is gonna go. And then tomorrow, back over here, back to the mill, back to making more, learning something new every day. Every log has its own pattern. You know, it has almost its own personality. It was very cool to look at the unique pattern. And again, just imagine that back here at Cerro Gordo in a studio of people looking around and enjoying for years to come. It was a really satisfying experience. Day two came at the mill and it was time to get the truck that was gonna bring all this wood back here to Cerro Gordo. So there it is, there's the Penske. We are back at Fred's. Let's go see how things are going in here. There's Jason and some of his wood. I think I'm late to the party. Do you think that's gonna get all the wood back to Cerro Gordo? Holy moly, yeah. <laughs> yeah. How many, how much wood are you taking back yeah, with you? As much as I can. <laughs> I gotta say, I have a great appreciation when I walk through those aisles of Home Depot now and I see the wood stacked everywhere. There is so much <laughs> that goes into wood that I just overlook, you know, that I just never think about. And I think at Cerro Gordo, that's one of my most cherished lessons, you know, just thinking about all the work that goes into everything around us. You know, a number of years ago, I took Galena, this, and I took it down all the way down to silver. And it gave me such a better appreciation for the silver that we wear or the silver that we see in coins or anything else of all the work that went into it. And now I just can't help but thinking about all the work that goes into all the wood around me. All right, so we have that big log. It's now down into this. We're making these into only one by four. So anybody have any guesses of how many one by fours are gonna come out of this stack of wood? To give you a better view, put in your guesses. The answer is 67, right there. <laughs> when notating and composing music, something that I think about a lot is basically the intention behind everything and wanting like every single note that I write down and every single dynamic on every single note or like slurs that connect notes. Um, it's really important to me that every single one of those things I have an explanation for it, where if somebody points at any point in a score, I could be like, and says like, why did you do that? That there's an answer for it. And I'm kind of approaching the studio the same way. And something that's really exciting about this wood is that now, you know, when somebody points at any board of wood in the studio someday, 
you know, years down the line that, you know, and it says, hey, why, why this wood, why this board? You know, I can be like, well, this is actually, you know, salvaged wood. Um, it's cedar, which is really good for dampening sound. Or if they wanted the floor, I can be like, that's Douglas fir, which is like hardwood, which is very, very good for recording music. And I think that it'll be a really cool story and really adds to the intention of the space. All right, that is it for day two of milling wood. This is our cedar so far. There's a little bit more cedar to go. Then we have to get some Doug fir for the floor, but uh, it smells amazing in this truck right now. And it's very satisfying to see all of this reclaimed, turn into boards and have a new life at Cerro Gordo. All right, this is this. This is it. This is the end of cedar. What do you think, Jason? Hey. <laughs> <laughs> this is it. This We're is all it. done with cedar. This is our last six or eight boards. You know, I think the day came and went and the stack of finished lumber had grown so much that I spent that evening just loading it all into the truck. All right, so big news. That is the beginning of the flooring. That's the, the Doug fur. We have finished all of the cedar, which is the walls and ceiling. So that's big. On to Doug fur, which is harder, different color. And uh, we're gonna keep rocking and rolling with it. Day three here. And so we're just gonna keep milling away and end up with some flooring, which will be pretty exciting. And see what we can do. By the time we got to day three of the mill, it was time to work. You know, I was needing to get back to Cerro Gordo. We still had a lot of board feet to do, but I had gotten better. I felt a little bit more smooth in the movements of, you know, taking off the wood from the sawmill or putting it through the rip saw. Everything just seemed to flow just a little bit more fluid that final day at the mill. And we got done. We ended up milling a lot of cedar, a lot of dug fir, but then there was all these scraps. And some of them are beautiful. You know, these slabs of cedar that could be made into tables or shelves or chairs. And typically that all gets discarded. But since we had all this room in the truck, I decided to take it all. I think for years, we've been able to have these artistic renditions of what could be made out of these different scrap wood of cedar. So that's it. Behind me is a lot of wood, about 2,500 board feet, plus all the scrap that we have. We have it all loaded up. It's going back to California. Uh, thanks again to Jason, Fred. Thank you guys so much. Haley, any parting words? This is awesome. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited to have some of Northwest Wood down Cerro Gordo. So thanks for coming up and thanks for incorporating me and some of the wood into your videos and into your home. Of course. Thanks, Fred. Yeah. I'm going to load this up because uh, the trip is not done. This now has to make its way all the way to Cerro Gordo. So stay tuned. By the final day of the mill, I just felt very close to everybody that was there. You know, we all had kind of this shared experience then and I felt a pang of sadness saying goodbye to Fred and Geraldine. You know, they were so hospitable. They were so nice. You know, say goodbye to Jason, who was so generous with his time, you know, with his expertise to teach us all. But it was time to hit the road. It was time to get back to Cerro Gordo. It was time to continue the process of getting this recording studio off the ground. All right, so the time in Washington has come to a close. It's time to get this truck with all the wood and this gold back to Cerro Gordo. It's gonna be a long trek, but we've got some precious cargo and some precious gold. And so on the way back, it was just a beautiful drive that went through thick forests, the likes of which I never see at Cerro Gordo, over streams and along lakes that I definitely never see up here in the desert. And the whole time, I just allowed my mind to wander, you know, to dream, to be inspired, to be creative over all the things to come here at Cerro Gordo. You know, I think that's what long road trips allow you to do. So as I pass by national parks, over straight lines, and finally into California, it almost felt like the wood was coming home. All right, final fuel up. We are almost back around 30 minutes outside of Keeler. This thing is definitely not making it up the road. So we're gonna unload it down in Keeler, load it into the five ton, so this wood can finally get to its new home up at Cerro Gordo. Okay, after a long journey from Washington State back, Keeler, California, final stop is up there. So this truck isn't making it up the road. We are headed to the trailer. This wood will then get escorted up to the town. All right, so the wood now is here in the box truck, fresh from Seattle. I drove the five ton down. Now this wood all needs to go into this truck 
and go up our slightly damaged road that's being fixed right now, but still is not perfect. So it might be a couple loads. You can tell all the wood got here pretty safely. It all looks great. Now we gotta fill in this, create the great Jenga problem of using this bad boy to get everything up. And so once it's all loaded, then we can start the trek up the eight mile dirt road. And I gotta say this music studio is going to be very special. And I think part of the specialness is the location and part of the location. And the interesting part about that is it's remote nature and how difficult it is to get there. And so no part of this is gonna be easy, but for right now, now we need to get stuff out of the Penske into the five ton, then we will head up the hill. All right, so the first load is into the five ton. Got a lot of wood coming up there, a lot of good looking wood too, which is exciting. Now, the next step on this journey from Washington in the woods to a mill, to a truck, to California is now up an eight mile dirt road that has proven to be difficult over the last little bit. So we're gonna see that this woods journey continues and then finally it will be home. As the wood got loaded into the military five ton, that's the only way to get up here to Cerro Gordo, I just felt gratitude. You know, I think many of my hopes and dreams over the past few years have come up Cerro Gordo's yellow grade road. And the more I thought about it, the more I realized hopes and dreams have been coming up Cerro Gordo's yellow grade road for 150 years. Since Mortimer Belshaw first cut in the road because he saw more potential here at Cerro Gordo. And I think coming up that road, I thought I too saw more potential here at Cerro Gordo. And this was just yet another journey of fulfilling that potential. So as the sun set and we weren't yet in town, that was okay because it felt like the story of the studio was building and it couldn't be any other way. And then under the moonlight, the wood finally reaches Cerro Gordo, all the way from Washington on a long road trip. We got it all here, didn't fall out. And with that, it's gonna be it. So here it is, the wood that began its life as trees up in Washington has safely made its way back here to Cerro Gordo. And I am very excited. You know, I know this journey to building the recording studio has just begun, but I already feel it. You know, I can imagine the people going in and out of the studio, the walls buzzing with activity. And I'm just excited about another community being able to tap into this beautiful place. You know, I hope that over the coming years, more and more communities have their own entryways into this town and their own ways to express themselves here. I just think it's a very exciting thing. And I just wanna say thank you. Everybody watching these videos is part of that community. You know, you all have been a huge part of making these past three and a half years the best three and a half years of my life. Uh, if you're out there and you're interested in participating in the recording studio in any way, I'm gonna leave an email address below. Feel free to reach out, throw out ideas, inspiration, Whatever you would like, we'd love to hear from you. And until next time, I hope you guys have an amazing week. I'm signing out. Thank you guys so much.